I thank him for his strength that he still gives me. And as your pastor and minister of the church, and uh, again, I'll allude to what I said to the elders yesterday. Um, it is a fact that if Jesus tarries, several of these men that are now sitting back with me, listening to me around me, will be doing this work that I'm doing. And one of them will be called to be the pastor of this work. <coughs> I have the four brethren now that are in place that are ready to then oversee the chapter. As I've spoken to them, uh, the gift of a pastor is biblical. It's in the scriptures. Uh, there's only one vessel can fill that at a time. The shepherd of the church under Christ. And these four men will pray, the Rhodes, the Langford, the Harrison, various. They will pray and there will be a gift. A pastor is not an elected office. Not a balloting office. That's why this church has never adapted the church world order of the people voting on a pastor or central headquarters sending a pastor. That's not biblical. But a gift of God is raised up in the midst of the church. I was raised up. I came here as a boy, 12 years of age. 64 years ago, a juvenile problem child, and by the predestination and foreknowledge of God, God let me go to live with a pastor of this church. I had no home at the time. Later, uh, when I first came to the church, then Sister Christine's father and mother, my aunt and uncle took me in, and then my father, my natural father, and the pastor made a decision. I had nothing to say about it, that I would go to live with my the pastor, and I would forever be separated from my father's home. I never lived again with my family. I lived with the pastor of the church, and it was God's will because the pastor of the church put in me the training, the word of God. And he looked after me, he was a wonderful man, kind man, gentle man, but a firm man. See, God foreknows our steps. He knows ahead of us what he's going to do. And I never lived with my father and my family again. They lived across the river. I never, I never was in their home. I was separated with this man built me a little house in the back of the uh, house where I now live. That became my study, my place of prayer. And he separated me from the world. I'd go to him when I was in junior high school, in high school, and I'd say, Brother Roberts, can I do this? Can I do this? He said, no. No, you can't. He said, you have been lent to the Lord. <coughs> Your father and I discussed the calling, the work you were to do, the gift that you have, and you can't do those things. Be content to be a servant of the Lord. And that firm, gentle guidance of that man, who was a rock of integrity, I trusted him with my life. Yes, sir. And uh, I, I let him guide me and he separated me from the world. And at the age of 17, placed me over the Fort Myers Church, uh, where we had started a work in Fort Myers. And he said, I'm going to put you there to train you, teach you, and let the gift develop in your life. And he put me there, and I started there. But it was the gift in me of a pastor it wasn't voted on. It wasn't selected by the church. The church never hired me. I've never been hired by a church. I'm not a hireling. 
I've never been hired by a church. I've never been voted on. I've never uh, agreed for a certain salary, benefits, to be a minister of the church. It was just the calling of God in me, and it was developed and nourished by men. Then at the age of um, 15, I went to Shepherdsville Campground, and the prophet of God, William Souders, walked out of a crowd of 2,000 people or more, came down, looked at me sternly in the eyes, thundered out in a voice, spoke in tongues, laid his hands on me, didn't know me, never met me, and he said, this day, this day, thus saith the Lord. Brother Roberts, that was my pastor's name, Brother Roberts, this boy will take your place. <laughs> this boy will take your place. He will take your place. Walked away. But the Souders, I never got to talk to him. But God used him to verify the will of God because God is a spirit. How many know that God is a spirit? The book of Numbers said God is not a man, that he should lie. And neither is he the Son of Man that he should repent. But God, Jesus said in John 14, 4, I think it is, St. John, the Gospel of John, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him. Like I told the brother from the Apostolic Church last night, he said, I've never seen this all. This liver, come on your brother. I've never seen a church operate like this. I said, well, it's because this church is not an organization. It's an organism. An organization is man-made, has headquarters in the earth. It's a vine of the earth. But Jesus said, I am the true vine. And St. John 15 and 1, but I am the true vine. Now, why did he say true vine? Because there are false vines. Yes, yes. And the vines of the earth are false. Yes. And their roots is in the earth. But the body of Christ, the church of the living God, is not an organization. It is an organism. It's a living, cellular, many-membered body that produces fruit. Yes. Yes. Uh, Somebody had given that scripture, given that scripture. And um, is it Numbers? Where Moses was having a problem with the princes of Israel. And he said, let's, let's prove God. Yes. You princes are giving me problems. I'm the leader of Israel, but you're giving me problems. He said, every man uh, of the tribe, the 12 tribes, take a, a, a rod and bring it to the uh, tent of assembly which was the tabernacle, um, and my, it's numbers, and then I, I wish I had that. I know the Esco don't have the scripture. And uh, they, they, they cut a rod out, all 12 men did. And uh, they brought that rod uh, to the tent of the assembly, and he said, Aaron, you bring a rod also. All right, thank you, number 17 6. And they had a rod apiece, 12 rods, and Aaron's rod. And he said, now you bring those rods, and we're going to see whom God approves of here. We're going to put this before God. See, God makes selection, and we can't. And you can't choose that man to be a pastor. And you can't choose that man to be a gift. That must be from God in that vessel. You can't choose a teacher. That's a gift of God. That's an ordaining of God. Uh, you may want to be an evangelist, but when you get up, your gift is going to speak for itself. You may want to be an evangelist, but if you are called of God to be a teacher, when you get on your feet, 
you'll start teaching. And you'll watch people taking out their notebooks, writing, interesting, taking scriptures down, because you're a teacher. That's one of the gifts. But the evangelist doesn't bother too much about that. The evangelist says, you have something he may want to teach. But you let him try it, he'll stumble all over himself. But if he lets that gift of the evangelist work, it'll start just overflowing. People start shouting, praising God, dancing. The Holy Ghost will fall on somebody. Now, the teacher doesn't do that, but the evangelist does. Let the prophet get up. He may want to he may want to uh, teach and he want to evangelize, but he can't. He'll get up and start saying, Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Such and such a day, such and such a month, such and such a year. This is going to happen. Yes. This is coming on the church. The He's a prophet. Amen. And you let a pastor get up. And that kind, tender. He's a sheep man. He's a He's a herder of the sheep. He's a He's a shepherd. He looks around. Is that person hurt? Are they feeling bad? And he'll leave all the rest of the sheep. And he'll go to that one sheep. And the 90 and 9 are there, but he is not bothering the 90 and 9. He's, he's a shepherd. You watch that gift operate in a man. Because he looks over there and sees that man that's left out. Feelings is hurt, been discouraged, feeling bad. And sooner or later, he'll get to that man. He'll catch him at the door, he'll call him on the phone, he'll go to see him, he'll spend time with him, he'll uh, ask him to meet him at a restaurant, have a cup of coffee, uh, he'll go to the house, he'll look at him and say, they have a need here? What do these folks need? Uh, he's a shepherd. He'll look at that little woman that nobody knows is crippled, can't hardly get along. And he won't let her leave, that he finds, tip her hand a little bit, I love you, I care about you. I call her up on the phone, because he's a shepherd. You can't put that in a man. You can't put that in a man. If that isn't from God, it will not be there. A shepherd is not unkind. He's kind. He's gentle. Because that's a long suffering. It's a giver. Because <clears throat> that gift is from God. You cannot let that. You can't have a ballot box out here and say, let's all select a shepherd. Let's all select an evangelist, a teacher. But God does that. You see? And you, you let uh, one of our sisters have a gift working in her, and that gift will manifest itself. That will come from her. That gift will work in her, and that, that it will show itself. She's different because there's a gift working in her. So the body of Christ is a many-member body, and when Brother Roberts saw me at 14, he said, son, come and be my son. Live with me. Because God put it in him to see the future. Well, we must see the past, and we must see the present, and we must see the future. And because you are a vessel of God, and God calls you, and God works for you, and in this ministry, that I, if Jesus tarry, will leave and go my, to my reward, there's going to be the five full minutes. Every one of those five fingers, the hand of God, that's the hand of God. That five, that's the cloud coming out of the sea, 1 Kings 18 and 44. Elijah's servant went out the seventh time to see. I'm glad he went that seventh time. <coughs> You've got to go God's time. One of the worst things that happens to people in their experience with God, they get impatient. God didn't answer me, I'm quitting. God didn't answer my prayers, I'm through. You, you stopped. 
just before God was ready to answer your prayer. You threw in the towel. You give up just before God was going to answer your prayer. Impatience. See, pay, that's why Jesus said, in your patience, possess ye your soul. God's bypassed me time and again. Everybody else, I haven't. God overlooked me. But just before God was going to look at you, hand you your job, tell you what to do, you may have quit. You may have stopped right there. Elijah's servant went out six times, came back and said, I don't see a cloud in the sky. There's nothing there. Oh, man of God, Elijah, said, go again. My God, I feel the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Go again. And he went the seventh time. What do you see upon Mount Carmel? I see a cloud. I can do a man's hand rising out of the sea. But what do we do, Elijah? Get thee down and get the chariots ready. For I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. It hadn't rained in three and a half years, 1260 days. There's a time God's going to let it rain again. You can quit the church. You can get weary. You can go to the world just before God starts to rain. But by vision, I see a cloud, a ministry. Amen, brother. I see a cloud rising for the rain. I see a cloud rising. In Jesus' name, cloud arising, and the rain through God's ministry. In Jesus' name, I see a cloud arising for the latter rain. So, the gifts of God are not put in the church by man's order. That's why this people doesn't have man's order. That's why we won't have man's order. But this is a living tree. I go back to Numbers, finish that type on uh, number 17. They brought their rods. And Moses said, let's prove God. The one that bud brings forth fruit. That's the one that's the covering of Israel. That's the one that we're going to put in that holy of holies. Yes, sir. That's the one that's going to be in the, in the Ark of the Covenant along with the hidden manna. Well, here come the tribe of Issachar. Here come the tribe of Dan. Here come the tribe of Reuben. The heads of those tribes they didn't have a sign of a bud on them. Not a blossom. Dead. Barren. Here come Aaron. Couldn't hardly hold his rod. Because it was budding. It was blossoming. And bringing forth islands. He couldn't hardly hold it. Trying to turn it into a tree. Holy. Because it had life in it. Where did that life come from? Where does all life come from? Doesn't come from organization. Doesn't come from man-made system. Doesn't come from elections. Doesn't come from prejudice. Doesn't come from pride. Doesn't come from religious stuff. It comes from God. Where did the seed in Mary's womb come from? Talk about that. Where did the seed come from? 
If God can't call those those things which are not as though they are, where did it come from? Where did it come from? The Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary. Suddenly she wasn't a barren virgin anymore. She had a child in her. She had Christ in her. She didn't elect it. She didn't choose it. Joseph had nothing to do with it. The priesthood didn't bring Christ there. But God decreed that he would become incarnate God. Praise the name of the Lord. This straining, this sweating, this trying to strive with flesh in the church of the living God, you might as well throw rocks at the sun as to think it's going to do anything. It's by my spirit. It's not by might. It's not by strength. It's not by power. But it's by my spirit. Saith the Lord. If God does not will that I serve him, I will not serve him. If God does not give me a hunger for him, I cannot manufacture it. I cannot bring it about. Kim folks can't brave on me. Mom and dad can't give it to me. Wife can't give it to me. Nobody can give me that hunger. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Where do you get that from? You don't get it from anywhere but the same God that placed that life in that womb and caused that rod to bud. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. So I don't have to strive with you. You're not going to take my place. No, sir. You're not going to steal my glory. No, sir. You're not going to take my reward. No, sir. You're not going to outrun me. No. Because if God decrees that I do, I will do. If God decrees I serve him, I will serve him. If God decrees that your prayer be answered, it will be answered. You don't have to take some sleep pill to go to sleep and lay at night and worry about it, either God is going to do it or he's not going to do it. Either God's going to let it come about, you, you might as well throw rocks to the sun and keep on praying, Lord, you do it or else. You better take that out of there. Yes, if sir. God decrees that something's going to take place in your life, it's going to take place, and hell and all the angels will not stop it. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen, brother. Amen. If God raises you up, nobody. They can be jealous of you. They can talk about you. They can run you down. They can ridicule you. Amen. But God will just keep on raising you up. Amen. If a car could have stood all day and say, stop it. Stop it, God. You made a mistake. You made a mistake. Aaron's rod is not the one my rod is. My rod is. Not Aaron's. You got mixed up, God. It wouldn't have mattered. There was only one rod Amen. that God touched. Praise the name of the Lord. That's why we're not to strive with each other. That's why we're not to be jealous of one another. That's why we're not to antagonize one another, belittle one another. Because if God raises you up, nobody, no one. If God keeps you, no one, no one will steal or rob like the thief because God will not let them. So uh, there's a scripture I wanted to go to and I, I just, uh, I, it's uh, Jeremiah uh, 10 and 23. Uh, see, it's not it's on this thought I'm dealing with here. And Jeremiah 10 and, and 23, uh, verse 23, O Lord, chapter 10, Jeremiah the prophet. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. O oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment. Not in thine anger, lest thou bring me nothing. God's going to correct me. I will not get away from correction. Because if I get away from correction, I'm a bastard. I'm a child. 
and not a son. For the Lord loveth, chasteneth whom he loveth, corrects every one of his children. You be without chastisement, you're an illegitimate child. You're not a legitimate son. But I don't want him to correct me in anger. I've seen God correct people in anger. And they came to nothing. <clears throat> never told this, I don't think, in this any gathering I've ever been in. I was a little boy. I made a trip to the campground. They put me on a work crew. And I was working around. My pastor put me on a work crew. We didn't play when we went to the campground. We worked. And I, I was on a work crew. And it was a fellow he put me with. She tears her among the wheat always. Always. And he put me with this uh, man. Had a shovel, wheelbarrow. And we were shoveling dirt, bringing it up around the old dining room. Not the one they have now, but the wooden dining room. Sawdust floor dining room on Shepherdsville. Brother Gene. Do you remember that? Was that in your day? That's too early for you. My job was to water down that sawdust before the people come in there to eat. Because they didn't have a dining room with a floor in it. Well, he said, let's go down and get some dirt and put around the flowers. Fourteen years old, I obeyed my pastor. But he had other things in mind. Got me on the side of the hill where the hill slopes down from the old reservoir. And he thought nobody saw, but God saw. There's an all-seeing eye. Aren't you glad there's an all-seeing eye? Nobody gets away from that all-seeing eye. That man had evil intentions. Put the shovel down, said, son, you don't have to work so hard. Come here. I want to love you a little bit. I never had met a man with a maladjusted personality and sexism. I could use other names. I met one that day. First time I'd ever met one. But instinctively, the Holy Ghost in me, oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad we've got something in us. And the Holy Ghost in me said, it's wrong. What he's going to do is wrong. You fight him. You run. Yes, sir. You get away. He'll destroy you. And I felt the Holy Ghost in me raising up. Yeah. Oh, Hallelujah. Yeah. And many a young man has been hurt by men like that yes, they have. in this life. Yeah. They were innocent. Those young men were innocent. Yes. He grabbed me and I saw I was going to run. He ripped my shirt. Ripped all the buttons off the front of my shirt. Well, I was fast in those days. Right. I could run like lightning. Sure. Run like a deer. Yeah. I just knew to run. Joseph knew to run. Get out of the house. Yes, sir. Right. Sometimes it's better to run yes, it and get away from something. Yes, and just think you can deal with it. Because you can't deal with it. No, sir. Get away from it. Yeah. And I ran up that hill, him right after me, ripped my shirt. I ran to my pastor. Thank God I had a pastor. I said, I don't know what he was trying to do altogether, but it was wrong. He ripped my shirt. He wanted to bring me up close to him. I said, that's wrong. Men don't do that. I knew that much, 14. But you know, the God of heaven put something in me that directed my steps. Yes, sir. Because it wasn't in me to understand. I didn't have the carnal knowledge of what was going on. But the Holy Spirit touched me. Yes, sir. Amen, amen. Yes, sir. Brother Souders, my pastor went to Brother Souders. I saw him standing up talking. Brother Souders had his hands folded and a straw hat on his head. Good there, those black, dark eyebrows with his pulled down together. Left my pastor, walked down to that house where that fellow was, ordered him out on the porch. I wasn't close enough to hear all he said, 
but it was thunder and lightning. Amen. Thunder and lightning. That fella reached out to Brother Souders and pushed Brother Souders. Did the wrong thing. Did the wrong thing. Touch not mine alone. Do my prophets no harm. Brother Souders walked away. He walked away. He went down the hill. Brother Souders said, you no longer can stay here. Down the hill you go. And he was merciful to him. But he touched a man of God. He got to Shepherdsville and the railroad tracks are there. You know where they are. The tracks there in Shepherdsville. The foot of the hill. He went to sleep on those tracks. And that afternoon a train took him into judgment. Because you see, there is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. It's not in man to do that. I thank God that we have something in us. In grace. In grace we have that. That can warn us, teach us, tell us, talk to us, lead us, and guide us. I say thank you, Lord, for that. So we're never at the risk of anybody. You're never a security risk to God. God has you in the palm of his hand. And he knows where you are. And he knows who you are. Oh, praise his holy name. I thank God. I, I tell you, we're not a security risk to God. God knows where we are and who we are. Because I don't want God. He corrected that man in anger. Because he touched the man of God. He tried to defile a child. And he touched it. And, and, but don't correct me in thine anger. He said, uh, lest thou bring me to nothing. Then go over to um, Genesis, if you would. And in the book of Genesis, the sixth chapter, um, here is uh, God dealing with Noah and the end of an age. And again, the Lord is showing that in man, there's nothing but evil and wickedness. But in God, there's grace. In God, there's strength. In God, there's help. In verse 3 of Genesis 6, And the Lord said, My spirits are always strive with man, for that he also is weak. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. That was the time God gave Noah. Verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord, and it made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. So man in that day was wicked in his imaginations and evil in his heart, and nothing was restrained from him. But when Jesus came, and set up the order of grace. And Aaron's rod is a picture of the grace of God that superseded the law. Because the law brought forth no fruit, no blossoms, no buds. All the 12 tribes brought forth no fruit, no blossoms, no buds. But Aaron's rod which is a picture of the covering of the priesthood of Christ. When Christ came, then everyone that followed him, they were not members of the Aaronic priesthood. They were of the Melchizedek order, which was Christ. And they followed him as disciples. And they were called and chosen to follow Christ. And the Bible said that when Jesus came, let's pick up Matthew 4 and 16, the Bible said that they which sat in darkness saw a great light. And them which sat in the region and shadow of death light is sprung up, verse 16, 
Matthew 4. And Jesus called his disciples to be disciples because grace had come. Aaron's rod was chosen. Christ, the older Melchizedek. It began to bud, and the disciples were the bud of Aaron's rod, or Christ's rod. And then blossoms came. And the blossoms was the about 120 that gathered in the upper room in Acts 2. See, first the blade. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like seed put into the ground, and it groweth, and men not know, know not how. First the blade, the bud, the twelve. And then, when that rod began to bring forth the buds of twelve apostles, they looked around, there were some blossoms. And lo and behold, on the day of Pentecost, in the upper room, there's not only the bud there, there were the blossoms there. See, the twelve were beside the 120. Scripture said there's about 120, but the 12 were not among them. The 12 were separated from the 120. 120 was the church. 12 was the ministry. And the ministry is always there to feed the church and nourish the church. See, the 12 were in the upper room before the 120 got there. Jesus chose them in Acts, the first chapter, because it, the rod had to have both. Then he brought forth the blossoms, about 120. Are you getting this picture right here? Amen. First the blade, Mark 4 and 28. First the blade, then the ear, 120. Then the full corn, the early church, thousands, 40 years dispensation. The fruit. There was the bud, there was the blossom, and there was the fruit. You watch, and I'm watching this work here right now. This work has not seen its greatest days. I thank God for the way he's blessed me these 50 years. I thank God for the labor he's given me. But I may not... I may not see the greatest days of this work. That's up to God. But I know by prophecy, yes, sir. I know by vision, and whether I see it or not, the greatest days of this work are the next level, are the next step. Yes. Because where we are now is not where God wants us to be. And where the body of Christ is now is not where God wants it to be. Because there must be an ingredient come back to the church called the Holy Ghost, the latter rain, for them to live holy. Because you cannot live holy without the Holy Ghost helping you to do it. Amen, brother. You cannot live godly without the Holy Ghost helping you to do it. It's useless for us to think that a church that has some darkness in it without the proper ingredients in it without divine order in it is going to produce the perfect fruit but there is another level i see a cloud arising latter rain is coming it isn't promised in the second day read your scriptures the outpouring of God is going to give people power to lay down sin in their life, lay down habits, lay down things they can't get rid of, they can't do, they can't have strength, desire to serve God, desire to sacrifice everything else for God, the desire to come together in one mind, one accord, one spirit. That's through the Holy Ghost. Yes. All the operation of the church is through the Holy Ghost. Amen. You can say to people, straighten up. Act right. Be faithful. Do what God wants you to do. Serve God. Live holy. They'll never do it unless they're filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Unless the Holy Ghost in them 
is guiding them, leading them, and teaching them. Praise the name of the Lord. They'll never do it. They can't do it. They can't do it. Because it's not the outer man, it's the inner man. Because the inner man is where Christ lives. He doesn't live in the outer man. There's not one bit of God in my outer man here. You know where God is in me? He's in the secret place. You know where the secret place is? It's your soul. That's where Christ dwells. I'm going to give you a scripture right here. You may have never considered it, never seen it, never understood it, but in the, in the, in, in the 91st, uh, um, I want to get this right, the 91st Psalm, uh, chap, uh, chapter 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You know who abides in a secret place? The soul? Christ does. This is not Psalm 91. It's not dealing with David. David never was in the secret place of the Most High. You and I with our carnal man, our outer man, is never in the secret place. Because a carnal mind is innocent against God, not subject to the law of God, Neither indeed can be. There's only one place that Jesus dwells. That's in the secret place. Jesus said, when you pray, you enter into your closet. And you pray in secret. He that seeth in secret will reward you openly. Where is your secret place? It's the soul. Yes. 